the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 86, European Renaissance Conclusions. How do you think of the European Renaissance? Erudite scholars basking in not only the bright Italian sunshine, but in the glory of the works of the art that suddenly sprung from their talented hands? We can imagine Michelangelo's chisel working on the soft marble as his iconic David emerged from the unformed block, or his struggle producing the decoration of the Sistine Chapel, how he would have laid on his back, fighting off muscle cramps as he tweaked an angle here and there, so that his representations were as realistic as possible. And he was just one example, admittedly close to, if not the pinnacle, but there were many others who came close. Italy was, it seems, bursting with artists, scholars and others who were keen to push the boundaries of art and architecture and education, all in the light of discoveries and rediscoveries. Or perhaps we should take it down a notch or several and think of the majority, who still lived their life of subsistence farming. Reliant on good harvests year on year and still subject to the whims of their overlord and the diktats of the church. And for the middle ground... Should we look to the merchant class, who from the end of the Middle Ages found that social mobility was a possibility in a limited way, something that could create a more comfortable life, albeit one that was dependent on fair trade winds and a good deal of luck? The Renaissance was broad and it was wide. So in this summary of the period, I've picked four of the most significant elements of the Renaissance to remind you about. By choosing the Italian rebirth, the Parisian theatre, the Spanish theatre and Commedia dell'arte, I hope I have picked on some of the most dynamic aspects of Renaissance theatre that also show how it was a continent-wide movement, yet that it was primarily national in its nature and individual characteristics. But, of course, it did all start in Italy, and I make no apology for starting there again and devoting a large portion of this episode to it. Those images that I opened the episode with are not individually fair and perhaps the point is that the Renaissance is such a broad and wide thing that any sort of summary does it a disservice. You may remember that when I started discussing European Renaissance theatre I picked 1453 and the fall of Constantinople as the starting point. That is a perfectly orthodox viewpoint and conveniently significant milestone, but, of course, a trickle of invention and discovery had started before then. Partly that was due to the exodus caused by the slow decline of the Eastern Roman Empire long before the fall of the capital city, and partly it was due to the expanding trading contacts outward from the Mediterranean. Where there was exchange of goods, there was exchange of ideas too. And I finished on the Renaissance some 200 years later, talking about art produced in the context of religious divisions and war moving through continental Europe. Priorities and ideas about what theatre was and what it should and could do had moved a long way in many respects. Nothing was more consequential than the invention of the printing press in 1439, so that later in the century the mass production of printed material was not only possible, but something that accelerated and proliferated through the subsequent decades. The medieval belief systems could be questioned, and now that word could be spread further and faster than ever before, with the proviso that we have to remember that reading and access to books was still a privilege afforded to only a few in society. But having rather glossed over the importance of the invention and spread of printing, I do feel that I should emphasise it here. By 1500, there were presses in 250 European cities, and print runs of individual works had grown from being in the hundreds of copies in the early decades of printing to 1500 copies and more by the end of the century. Printing was spreading knowledge and entertainment far and wide. So there was a melting pot of slowly churning new ideas, and more than one spark that set things running. The fall of Constantinople was certainly one of them, but other factors like the invention and increased use of gunpowder and other scientific advances all played their part. And how did theatre react to all of this? Well, ironically, by looking backwards. The playwrights of the early Renaissance either continued to write cycle plays in the religious mode or tried to reproduce the glories of Roman culture as they saw it by copying Roman plays and, to a lesser extent, their Greek predecessors. 
along with the rediscovery of the plays of Rome, works that explained the Roman view of architecture and for theatre came back into the public domain. This particularly means part of the work on architecture by Vitruvius, where he describes aspects of the built Roman theatre and how good sightlines and acoustics could be achieved. But beyond this, theatre in the Renaissance had a slow start. As I said in the first episode, when we think of the Renaissance, we don't immediately think of theatre. No, we think of great art and artists, statues and sculptors, great buildings decorated with frescoes and imposing paintings. We can think of innumerable artists, of musicians who took music to new heights using the latest musical inventions, but plays and playwrights don't spring to mind. When was the last time you saw the revival of a play from the late 15th or early 16th century? But I think you'll agree we did find plenty to talk about, starting with Albertio Musato, with his plays that revived literary Latin in 1315, which was the first post-ancient tragedy. That is an incredibly early date, but unlike many who came after him, he didn't feel compelled to follow the classical rules of tragedy. In fact, as things turned out, the fact that a tragedy is the earliest recorded Renaissance play also goes against the general trend, where comedy and the lighter pastoral dramas were the most popular forms in the period. The first comedy recorded is from 1390. This was written by Pierre Paolo Vareggio and is a cautionary tale about a student of the liberal arts and the dangers of his wild lifestyle. It is humanist in nature, written in Latin, and has elements of both Roman and contemporary comedy. The advancement of humanism in the period gets coupled with an increasing concern for the individual, and a concern with individual behaviour is a significant feature of the period and particularly present in the plays of the time. That reflects the fact that many of the plays were written by scholars of one sort or another who were keen to escape the confines of church teachings and discuss openly new ideas as they emerged. When attempting to join the dots for the development of theatre in the Renaissance, the next major point comes in 1502 with the rediscovery and publication of seven plays by Sophocles. Up to this point, things moved extremely slowly. The ideas contained in those early plays didn't spark a great movement, but they did not completely die in the subsequent century either. The gap is why the rediscovery of Sophocles is seen as such an important event. It was the time when Venice came to the fore as the home of scholarly work and printing of Greek texts as they emerged. Shortly prior to the publication of Sophocles, works by Aristotle, Aristophanes and others had already been published and those of Euripides soon followed, along with Latin translations. Now, the Greek plays were available to the literate class, and the pull of the ancients was reinforced. Creativity in the modern sense was curtailed by the demands of the church, and the threat of severe punishments for stepping out of line from local political leaders. So, that looking back for something new, something that could be justified as scholarly work rather than simply entertainment, is perhaps not so surprising. The trigger for producing new plays appears to have been the translation of Aristotle and publication of an explanatory essay by Giovanni Trissino in 1508. Through publication of his translation of the Poetics and his own plays, ideas about the structure of plays were openly discussed and a long-term adherence to Aristotle began. He also wrote the first blank verse play that we know of. Then we came to the familiar name of Duke Ercole d'Este and his state of Ferrara, that was a powerhouse of theatrical creativity under his guidance and that of his descendants. Seneca's Phaedra got what was probably its first ever public performance there in 1486, in a version called Hippolytus. And you might also remember from way back in the Roman season mention of performances of the Menachmus brothers there as part of a lavish wedding celebration. From Ferrara, productions moved to Rome and other cities for special performances, and patrons such as cardinals began to appear. The sense is that plays, comedy and tragedy, were becoming accepted as part of particular celebrations and the carnivals that were enjoyed by all at regular intervals. Some form of toleration by the church, yes, but in places at least more than this, encouragement and enjoyment too. In 
It's this patchwork effect that makes a summary of the progress of theatrical renaissance rather difficult. Ferrara, Venice and Rome were leading lights in theatrical presentations, but they were just pockets of activity, where other parts of the country were much more restrictive and slow to accept anything but religious theatre. At this point, the country was not at all unified, with individual states on the peninsula keeping their own influence, and I think this is one of the main reasons for the very slow cultural spread that we can detect. 1541 saw our first playwright of real note, Giovanni Giraldi, known by his pen name of Cynthio. He is particularly noteworthy because, not content to regurgitate old plots, he created his own. The result was an extraordinary tragedy, Orbache. That was Senecan in style, but outdid Seneca in bloodthirsty violence, which is no easy feat. From here, a path can be traced that leads directly to Elizabethan revenge tragedy, and his gender-swapping comedy and plots for his prose work turn up in Shakespeare and others. This fixation with the ancient past and with the adherence to stage theory of the period made the Italian rebirth of secular tragedy a rather academic exercise, and one that lacked a contemporary response that could attract and support a large and diverse audience. Playwrights, it seems, were pleased with showing off their own knowledge of the ancient classics, but this left them speaking to a reduced audience, and one that was made very much in their own image there's no real inspiration that could engender a significant leap forward. Looking back into an ancient past that they didn't fully understand, and one that in many respects still eludes us today, was not going to produce anything but inferior copies that didn't speak to the contemporary audience. Comedy fared a little better in the early Italian Renaissance, with works after Terence and Plautus appealing to the modern Italian sensibilities more than tragedy ever did. Commedia Erudata was the result, with several popular works from Tito Livio, Veraggio, and even from the greatest poet of the day, Petrarch, although sadly his theatrical efforts are lost. But the Latin language was a problem. Even in the courts of the day, not everybody in attendance at a play would have been fluent in Latin and capable of following a complex and fast-moving plot. Many actors would also not have comprehension of the language, and most had been reciting lines in badly pronounced Latin that had only been understood with laborious effort. This was no way for comedy to thrive. It was only in the early years of the 16th century that comedy truly found its feet, and that was one of the greatest moments of creativity where three giants appeared writing for the stage at the same time, Ariosto, Machiavelli and Aretino. I refer you back to episode 65 if you need a reminder about their activities. But in summary, Ariosto worked out of Ferrara and produced an epic poem, Orlando Furioso, sections of which were used by many later playwrights as a basis for plots. Many of his plays followed Plautus and were well received by his courtly audience. But it is in his other achievements that we can see real progression in theatre. His achievements were to contemporise the stock characters in comedy, to produce comedy in the vernacular and abandon Latin, and to develop the creation of theatrical spaces, this last effort thanks to the purse of the Dukes of Ferrara. Machiavelli is better known for his political activities and his treatise on the art of government than his plays, but Mandragola, the Mandrake, completed in 1520, is a significant milestone and one of the few plays from the period that still gets performed today. In the Roman comic style, it is nevertheless a completely original comedy. On the strength of this play, many commentators regret that Machiavelli did not write more for the stage. Aretino is less well known, but you might remember the story of his rise from obscurity and his association with Hanno the Pet Elephant of Pope Leo X. His life story is quite fantastic and worth a re-listen if it escapes you now. Amongst the other playwrights that flourished, Annibal Caro is significant and has another great backstory involving the intrigues of popes. His 1543 play, written in secret for the illegitimate son of the Pope, threw off Aristotle and introduced three plot strands, one of which was highly political and it was probably a good thing for the safety of the playwright that it wasn't performed until after his death. 
and other playwrights followed. I particularly mentioned Piccolomini and Cecchi in episode 66, both of whom had interesting life stories and progressed theatre further. What appealed to Cecchi's audiences in particular was his colourful use of the local language spoken by characters that, although based on stock types, were given plenty of local vigour. Character comes alive in Cecchi's work in a way that had not been seen before. The fact that almost all of his plays found their way into print in his lifetime, and therefore became much more freely accessible than was the case for most of his predecessors, was another significant milestone. I continued to talk about Cecchi in the context of religious drama, something he focused on in his later years. That gave, I think, the necessary balance to all of this popular comedy and secular tragedy. Although by the mid-1500s the move away from the medieval was well underway, the church and some medieval thinking still held significant influence, and particularly in Italy, where the religious reforms happening in the rest of Europe were slow to take hold. Cecchi deliberately mixed comedy with his religiously themed plays and made his crude and lowly characters as significant to the plot of his plays as his noble and high-born ones. He updated the settings of biblical stories, expanded them and represented traits and temptations in real characters, rather than making them purely allegorical. This was the first true merging of religiously themed drama with the techniques of secular theatre, and he did it in an attempt to attract as broad an audience as was possible. By also discussing the Hebrew comedies of De Simone and the tragic comedies of Della Porta that were produced about the same time, I tried to show that there were dramatists who were flexing their artistic muscles against the tide of the times, where religious constraints were again in place. Italian theatre had developed into something that was not just a rehash of Roman theatre or an extension of the medieval cycle play. Renaissance theatre spread out from Italy and found a welcoming home in France, particularly in the south of the country and in the capital Paris. The acceptance and then love for Italian theatre was helped no end by the presence of a Medici queen, who as wife and then mother to a succession of kings held influence for a long time. Catherine de' Medici's arrival in France catapulted the Italian arts to the fore and they did not loosen their grip in France for the rest of the period. However, much of my focus was not on French playwrights, for they took some time to emerge, but the site of theatre itself in Paris, the Hotel de Bourgogne, and the group who ran the theatre in Paris, the Confraternity of the Passion. When local playwrights did present themselves, the serious ones, who were not just translating Italian comedies, like Etienne Jodel and Jean de la Taille, became completely enamoured with the rules of Aristotle and Greek theatre in general, and constrained themselves with conformity, while annoying the king with their Dionistic activities off stage. Episodes 70 and 71 told the full story of French theatre in the period, but you might remember the development of tennis courts into theatre spaces and the arrival of the second Parisian playhouse, the Théâtre de Marias. Still, France lacked a playwright of real note, with the possible exception of Robert Garnier, until Antoine de Montcrestien turned up in 1575. He managed to produce tragedies that were very closely in the Greek mould and, against the trend of the time, were popular with a Parisian audience. The arrival in Paris of three Italian comic actors gave comedy a boost that it didn't really need and introduced us to the influence of Commedia dell'arte in France for the first time. I concluded in Paris with the story of Valorin de Leconte, the first actor-manager who we have personal details for, and how he found success in association with playwright Alexander Hardy, arguably the greatest French playwright of the period. And then from France we went to Spain, and there we saw how the Spanish embraced the drama coming out of Italy and turned it into something all of their own. There are, I think, in the broadest view, two interrelated main reasons why that happened. They hit upon a form of theatre building that really suited them and their plays, and they produced playwrights of a calibre that was not matched in other countries in continental Europe. And yes, I'm specifically excluding England from that statement. I speak, of course, of the Corrales, of Lupe de Vega, and of Calderon de la Baca. There's also 
an unrelated third factor. As a country, Spain, excluding the Andalusian south, of course, was far less fragmented than Italy was. Ideas could travel more easily, printing was adopted quickly, and many of the local dialects were interchangeably understood. But I'm not saying that this was some paradise for playwrights and theatregoers, not at all. The church held its grip for longer in the period in Spain, and the punishments meted out by the Inquisition and other courts could be severe. But Spain, like England at the time, was looking outward with growing confidence. And as they extended territories across the seas, their theatre looked to become a national theatre, and one that held a conversation not about ancient Greeks and Romans, but about contemporary Spaniards and their concerns, and they did that by retelling local myths and legends that already existed as part of their heritage. Spanish theatre was revitalised by the Italian Renaissance, but it's quite possible that a strand of remembrance from their own Greek, Roman and Visigothic predecessors remained and fed into the new drama. We'll never be quite certain of the exact route from the distant past, but in the Renaissance, the liturgical theatre and secular theatre merged more strongly than in any other parts of Europe as it did in Spain. There's some evidence that liturgical theatre was flourishing early in Spain and many works continued these traditions for centuries but secular Latin theatre found a home in the universities where it was nurtured and slowly introduced to the public as secular theatre. By the late 1400s, plays based on rhetorical arguments that originated in the universities are in evidence, but the first complete play to survive is still religious in nature. Celestina by Fernando de Rojas followed soon after and is generally taken to be a play with one foot in the medieval and one in the Renaissance. It had a long afterlife, being recycled by many Renaissance dramatists in many forms. Then came Juan del Elcina, with his love of Italian comedies, whose torch was then taken up by Lucas Fernandez. Bartolomeu de Torres Naro perhaps best exemplifies the typical Spanish playwright, as a former soldier, a priest and a playwright. It's a combination that turns up frequently in Spain as the period progressed, and military service was a common start to life for young men who would then become devoutly religious and yet still crave to be creative. Naro is remembered in Spain for many achievements, but in this summary I'm just going to highlight his first-of-a-kind play in the cloak and sword genre. Taking its name from the street clothes and weapons of choice of the swaggering young men about town, the themes of honour and revenge became the mainstay of the Spanish theatre in subsequent decades. As Spanish playwrights embraced Renaissance thinking more firmly, they introduced tragicomedy, some of which took the themes of biblical stories and expanded them within secular and mythic frameworks. In Madrid and other major cities, theatre was appreciated and expanded, until in the mid-1500s, Lupe de Rueda took the adapted Latin comedy to its highest point and produced the most commercial theatre yet seen. And this is not to forget the strand of religious drama that developed out of the auto-sacramental and remained popular, eventually developing into a form of tragedy. Juan de la Cueva marks the end of the early Spanish theatre with his tragedies that took up national Spanish themes and a political and social focus. In just 14 plays, he formed the basis that the golden age of Spanish theatre would launch from. From our perspective with long hindsight, All of this was leading up to Lupe de Vega, the Shakespeare of Spain, the world's most prolific playwright. To check those claims, you'll have to listen back to episode 75, but there is no doubt that Lupe stands astride Spanish theatre like no other. Through his prolific work, he virtually created the form of the Comedia, a title that's become synonymous with quality Spanish theatre. As I concluded on Lupe de Vega, I said that he remains a difficult character to pin down. Playwright, poet, author, soldier, adventurer, religious cleric, husband, inquisitor, father, philanderer, all of the above and more. He was able to reconcile these apparently conflicting lives and still produce a vast amount of high quality work that shaped a major strand of Renaissance period theatre and left a legacy in Spanish and European theatre that can be traced through to the Baroque and beyond.
Given more time, I would also remind you about Calderon de la Baca from episode 77, but I must move on, and I've not even left myself enough time to remind you about the chorales and their stages and their patios, the segregation of the audience, the language of the fan, and, and everything else that went on there. Or how the actors and the managers organised themselves and produced play after play week after week. But it's all still there on the podcast feed, and you can re-listen at your leisure if you feel the need. And so back to Italy and the Commedia dell'arte. The form and the troops who performed it certainly deserve their place as a pillar of Renaissance theatre. Of all the forms of Renaissance theatre, this is the one that you had probably heard of. Thanks to its longevity, we all know something of the masks and the characters, maybe even the acrobatics. You've almost certainly seen plays that use the techniques and characters of the Commedia. Richard Bean's One Man and Two Governors is an adaptation of Goldoni's play from 1745, itself essentially a Commedia dell'arte comedy. The National Theatre production saw James Corden playing the scheming servant, only just about keeping his plans on track while worrying about where his next meal is coming from. That version is available on the National Theatre streaming service and well worth a watch if you've not already seen it and even if you have. If you're in the UK, you may have seen a complete episode of the dark comedy Inside Number 9 called Wuthering Heist that has a pantalone leading a host of Commedia dell'arte characters in a heist caper. That is still available on the BBC iPlayer if you're quick. Then there are some less obvious tie-ups. Have you ever thought of Hugh Laurie in House as Il Dottore or Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory as the show-off but cowardly Il Capitano? The miserly and foolish characteristics of Pantaloni can be seen in characters as diverse as Scrooge in A Christmas Carol and Eugene Krabs from the Spongebob Squarepants cartoon. I have to confess I take the last point on good authority, not personal experience, so feel free to contradict me if that seems wrong. I'm not going to run through the main points here again of Commedia dell'arte as it's quite recently detailed in episodes 80 to 83, but just to reiterate that this was popular theatre, at the height of popular theatre at that. Its character set may be limited and familiar, but its plots and settings were diverse and ultimately entertaining for one end of society to the other. It also provided us with some wonderful characters in the actors who performed the plays and the exploits they got up to to promote their art and sustain their living. The Italians took Paris by storm and won the hearts of the French people to the extent that the form became as much a French love as an Italian. I very much enjoyed telling you about the Montebanks and the Charlatans and how Commedia dell'arte really emerged out of the lived experience of people of the time. Some of the struggles of the troops on their travels, being thrown into jail on at least one occasion and their over-enthusiastic response to an expected generosity of a patron are stories that really bring these long-dead actors to life. We also know something about the individuals who ran the troops. You'll remember Flaminio Scala and Francesco Andarini and their Galesi troop. And then Isabella Andraini and Vittoria Pesimi provided us with a look at women who made their mark in theatre and how very memorable and significant they are. And I had a great comment from Tim on Twitter who really captured the essence of the art by commenting that Commedia dell'arte is like the blues a simple framework within which endless variations are played out. That, I think, really does sum it up very nicely. So there we are. The best I can do for a summary of this long and in many ways diverse period. That at the same time is stayed and seems reluctant to move on. That, I think, is the overall impression that I'm left with. And in all of this, I haven't mentioned La Pellegrina, the Italian comedy for a Renaissance wedding, the Germanic theatre, the Perspective Theatre in Italy and beyond, Benini and architecture, and the theatre in the Netherlands, all of which you can find in the episodes on the podcast feed. I think when we look back at the period from 10,000 feet, the big changes that I would pick out are related. There's a move away from adherence to the church, there was more freedom of thought and slowly, that meant that secular theatre could get a foothold and ideas could begin to spread through presentation and discussion within plays. As the playwrights and other thinkers found that freedom, humanism became a central plank of modern thinking. 
something that could and did face up to the church and argue their case with rational thought and, in many cases, considerable artistic accomplishment too. Life for the common man may not have changed much. We may not think too much of the style and the content of Renaissance period plays. But the brightest lights of the period still shine and influence what we produce on stage today. So there we are, the season on European Renaissance Theatre complete. Well, almost. One more episode to go to officially complete the season with eight places of seeing episode. Following that, there will be a bit of a hiatus in the historic narrative as I take some time off and then prepare for season five. No spoilers yet. But I'm not going to abandon you completely, as I have a few bonus episodes lined up that will drop at regular intervals. So keep subscribed to the podcast feed, and those will drop to you as soon as I release them. There is a Renaissance coda, a bit of something Greek, and something else that I'll keep completely under wraps for the moment. Those should fill the gap between seasons pretty nicely, I think. But before then, places of seeing next week. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page, which continues to grow, with over 1,000 likes now. You can also keep up to date on Twitter, and of course, there is even more additional information on the website, where you can find all the episodes, blog posts, and other related things. That's all at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. If you would like more audio content relating to the podcast and other things related to the history of theatre, please take a look at the offering on Patreon, where you can access all of the content for a small monthly fee. I've put links to the website, Patreon and to Ko-fi.com for one-off donations in the show notes. Thanks again for listening and your support in whatever form, and I look forward to your company next time. But if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.